So this is module six, which is the movement of energy. Um, so basically ecosystems, if we look at energy, um, we're looking at energy in an ecosystem. Um, so within an ecosystem, there are certain boundaries. So we might talk about an ecosystem being um, a huge um, area with all the different types of niches, or an ecosystem might be simply just a little um, nook in a, a branch, um, for example. So it could be, we, we could talk about little tiny ones, or we could talk about the whole picture. So, and we often talk about both. It just depends on what we're looking for. Um, so within the ecosystem is obviously the biosphere. So the biosphere is just anything that's living um, within our, um, our world. All right, so here's our boundaries. Um, and so, like I mentioned, um, ecosystems can be large, huge areas. Um, so, for example, in this uh, picture on the left, um, you've got all of Yellowstone Park. So all the boundaries within Yellowstone Park, this would be the ecosystem within that park. So this is a huge, huge area, um, a huge ecosystem that we're talking about. I mean, it's, it's you know, part of two different states. Um, or we could be talking about a small little ecosystem. So in this case, it's um, the nook in this tree. Um, so we've got a bunch of different organisms um, living within this ecosystem. And this ecosystem could be living, and there could be you know hundreds of these ecosystems, thousands of them, um, living within this larger ecosystem. Um, and we look at those for a variety of reasons. The small ones are really just as, as important as looking at the large ecosystems. Um, so we'll look at both throughout the year. All right, and there's some vocabulary here for you. So this is probably a review from bio, hopefully. Um, but producer is just something that produces energy. So it's capturing energy usually from the sun, or it could be capturing energy um, via chemosynthesis, which happens like at geothermal um, vents deep in the ocean, hydrothermal vents. Um, but usually producers are going to be our photosynthesizers. That's typical. Um, and then, of course, photosynthesis is just capturing that energy from the sun um, and forming glucose, which all the other organisms that are um, not producers use. Um, and then a couple other terms, cellular respiration um, review from um, bio. Um, but that's how um, the organisms, the producers um, or consumers are using those chemical compounds. So they could be um, you know, producers or consumers, but cellular respiration is how your cells utilize that energy. Um, and then aerobic versus anaerobic. Aerobic is um, with oxygen, anaerobic is without. Um, so as you learned in bio, um, our cells go through both. Um, so they're both anaerobic, anaerobic um, respiration within, um, within cellular respiration. All right, so um, looking at this um, picture here, this diagram, we've got a producer and a consumer. So the producer is utilizing um, energy from the sun and it's converting carbon dioxide and water into oxygen as a byproduct in a sense, and then making glucose. And so you should definitely know this equation. So this is um, cellular respiration. So producing, consuming, um, it's basically in reverse. So for photosynthesis, you've got solar energy plus water plus CO2, um, and that yields glucose and oxygen. And then the opposite of that respiration would be um, energy consumed, used, um, plus water plus CO2. So we're breathing um, in, um, and or actually it's the opposite, sorry. Um, so we're breathing in here. Um, it's kind of reverse here. But we've got oxygen, we're breathing in using glucose, and what's produced is CO2, our exhale, um, water, and of course, energy. That's the whole reason for cellular respiration is so that we can acquire energy um, to be able to use it. So um, notice the equations are basically the opposite. They're the same here, but the, they reverse the arrows. Um, so basically just flip the equation. Um, and that should be a review from bio. All right, um, so a few more terms for this um, ecosystems. Um, when we look at ecosystems, um, we, of course, want to look at every single aspect of the ecosystem. So we're looking at consumers, we're looking at um, producers, we're looking at specific kinds of consumers. Um, we've got an herbivore, uh, we've got a carnivore, um, secondary consumers, that would be, um, you know, like, like a, a, a mountain lion, for example. So a mountain lion is going to eat a primary consumer, meaning like a deer or something. Um, and then tertiary could be um, a hawk or something that is eating 
um, the dead mountain lion or, you know, maybe a vulture, for example, not a hawk, but a vulture um, that could be a tertiary consumer. So it's eating something that has eaten something else. Um, and then there's these different trophic levels. So um, trophic levels, when we watch the video about the wolves um, repopulating Yellowstone, um, those they were talking about trophic level, the trophic cascade. So all these different trophic levels are energy levels, basically um, organisms consuming another organism. And, um, and that's really important when we look at the overall um, abundance or diversity of the ecosystem. It has to do with how much energy is available. So before I had mentioned a desert um, doesn't really have much diversity because there's really not a lot of um, producers, there's not a lot of energy available. And so you can't have a super abundant um, diversity of life when you don't have a lot of energy. Uh, but those are trophic levels. As you go up in the scale of consumers, you have less and less energy because of entropy, because of the energy, there's less and less available basically. Um, and then the food chain is just showing this. So the food chain shows how um, energy moves through the ecosystem. So if we look at this example of uh, um, the trophic levels, um, we've got our producers, which would be the grasses. Um, and then we've got, in this case, this is probably the savanna, but um, we've got a zebra, so primary consumer. And then you've got a secondary consumer being a lion. Um, you could have in this aquatic, and then, then, like I mentioned, you could have a vulture up here or something. Um, and then aquatic food chain, um, very similar, algae maybe. Um, then you've got zooplankton, um, fish, and then maybe the bald eagle is eating the fish. So that would be an example of the tertiary consumer. Um, we would definitely be a tertiary consumer. Um, we eat um, a variety of things. Uh, we could also be primary consumers if we're just eating plants. Um, we're vegan or something like that. And we really are a combination of anything um, humans are. All right, so um, so the different things I mentioned, food web, um, it's just showing that level of complexity. Um, so a food chain is just showing one chain of events. So if we look back at this, this is a food chain. So just showing one direction. It's not showing all the different scenarios or possibilities, whereas a food web shows all the different possibilities, and we'll look at that here in a minute. Um, and then scavengers are just organisms that consume dead animals, like a vulture, for example. Um, a detritivore decomposers, these are just terms that you guys need to know, um, but a detritivore basically breaks down dead tissue, um, waste products, um, a good example of a detritivore, um, like a beetle, dung beetle, um, things like that. And then decomposers, your typical fungi, bacteria, the things that grow on the food in your fridge that you leave in there too long, um, those are all types of decomposers, um, the things that are ultimately putting the the energy back into the soil. All right, so here's our food web. Um, and of course, savanna again is the biome that we're in. Um, but you can see uh, we've got our producers. So there's a list of the different terms that we talked about, but producers would be our grasses. And then this is just showing all the different scenarios. So that's why it's a food web. Um, so it's just how they're webbed and intertwined together rather than just one um, scenario. And so, um, so you've got a variety of things here and it just shows what they are. So you can see some things can be both. Um, so a lion here can be a scavenger. Um, it can also be a secondary consumer, just like humans can be a variety of things. Um, we're really never decomposers or detritivores ever, um, but we could be scavengers. We could be secondary consumers. We could be primary consumers. We're never producers. Um, you know, we can't make our own food out of our bodies. But um, but you can see a variety of things are more than one thing. They can be a variety. And so that's definitely a simplified food web. Obviously, it's more complex than even that. All right. And then um, a couple other terms. We're going to look at a lab that goes over net primary productivity. Um, but we refer to these and you'll see them um, on the AP test or in class. And we'll refer to, refer to them as just GPP or NPP. It's much easier than the whole um, word. But gross primary productivity, that's how much energy is available in the whole ecosystem. So that really falls on the producers. How much food are they producing? And we can't use all that food. So like if um, we eat um, organisms like producers, like um, plants, we don't use all of that energy. So there's the stalk, um, there's the roots, there's things like we don't use every single part of the plant. We can't digest every single part of the plant. So really, not all of that's available. And then there's water and there's other things that the plant has. 
Um, so the NPP, the net primary productivity, that's what we're really concerned with because how much energy is actually like available minus what the plant uses. Um, so minus the roots and the stock and the water and, you know, the flowers and things that are produced that we just don't use. So the NPP is really important for how much energy is available for the rest of the ecosystem. All right, so if we look at this, um, it's kind of surprising how little is actually available. So if we look at the gross primary productivity, so all of the energy coming in, 60% um, of it's lost to respiration. So 60% of the energy that the plants actually captured or captures isn't available. Um, and if you look at the bottom here, 40%, um, it's for growth and function. So basically 40% of the energy that's actually um, converted, photosynthesized, is actually really even available. Um, so it's not a lot. So that's why when you go to areas that are really productive, like a rainforest, you see a huge abundance of plants. There has to be a huge abundance of plants to support all of the life that the rainforest has. When you go to a desert, you don't see much life. And that's because there's not a lot of productivity going on. There's not a lot of um, photosynthesis happening. Um, and this is also kind of surprising too, that 99% of energy that comes in isn't used. Only about 1% of the energy that comes in from the sun is actually used, which is crazy. If we could capture, um, they've said like, if we, if we as humans could capture all of the solar energy that comes in, in one day, we could power the entire world for a year. That's how much energy comes in that we just can't capture. So it's um, pretty amazing um, how much energy is actually available that we just can't use. All right, and then a few other things. I know there's a lot of vocabulary in this, but biomass, um, that's all living matter in that area. So if we take all the living stuff um, that's within that area, that's called biomass. It might not all be usable, but we consider that as biomass. Um, and then a standing crop would be like what's, um, what's there at a particular time. So think about here in Reading. In the springtime, our standing crop is a lot more than maybe in the summertime. Um, when we don't have a lot of growth happening. Um, so our biomass can change throughout the year. It's not always the same. Um, and then the efficiency is how well that's used. So how well does it transfer from one trophic level to the next? Um, it depends on what's growing. Is it something that is um, really fibrous and we can't really break down, we can't really use in our bodies? Or is it something that is really used efficiently, um, like grass or um, or wheat or hay or something like that. Um, so it just depends on what it is. And then a pyramid shows that representation. So that's on the next page. Um, so here's our um, trophic pyramid. So um, what you need to know about this, what's really important to remember is that only about 10% of the energy is used at each level. So here's our trophic levels, producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and then it shows the amount of energy in joules that is available. So at the producer level, we have 10,000 joules available. But at the next level, there's only 10% available, so 1,000 joules. And then at the next level, there's 100. So think about like it, the, your experience in an ecosystem. You go out in an ecosystem, and how many mountain lions do you see? Probably not very many. Um, how many deer do you see? Probably a lot. I went out riding today, saw two deer, never saw a mountain lion, but I saw two deer just on my ride today. And then how much vegetation is there? There's vegetation all over the place. So, um, so think about it any, anywhere that you go, how many of the top producers, how many bald eagles do you see in an area versus fish? Probably not very many compared to how many fish there are. Uh, and then there's probably a lot of bacteria or not bacteria, but a lot of algae and a lot of um, plant growth. So um, only about 10% of the energy is usable. Like I said, that's really important to remember. Um, that's a number that you should have ingrained in your head. Um, that 10% is only usable at each level. So therefore, you have to have a huge producer level in order to have an abundant and diverse upper level. So the rainforest, great example, huge diversity, because think about all the plants that you have seen in the rainforest versus all the plants that you see in like the desert. Um, so, so pretty important. And that's it. So hopefully you enjoyed that. Thank you.